fun. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Before I introduce myself officially, I want to do a little thought experiment about the word flexibility. Um, when most of us think of the word flexibility, you think of somebody being able to do the splits, someone being able to stretch really far into a position. But the funny thing is that the word itself isn't called stretchability or lengthenability. However, we always think about it in terms of increasing range of motion into length or being able to stretch. The name of my presentation is Optimizing Flexibility, right? And in order to understand how to optimize flexibility, you have to understand first that flexibility is actually about flexing muscles, that it's about shortening muscles. And we're going to come back to this, but I just wanted you guys to think about how as I go through this information, it's possible that we've been sort of thinking about it all wrong. Okay. So my name, as Brian introduced, is Nick Bartolotta. I am a, a licensed physical therapist. I'm also a holistic health practitioner, which is basically a, a thousand hour masseuse. I did a thousand hour massage program uh, at the International Professional School for Body Work in San Diego. Um, originally though, I got a rhetoric major from Berkeley. so. Fancy that, I was going to be a lawyer. Um, I'm also uh, the creator of DCT, which you guys have some information on your, on your tables, but dynamic contraction technique is a form of resistance stretching um, that you'll find out very soon. Uh, I was introduced to uh, the, the genre of resistance stretching uh, when I was in college, and DCT is my iteration of what I learned. Um, and then finally, when we get to optimizing flexibility, I'm going to introduce a product that I invented in 2008 and got patented finally in 2012 called the DCT ProFlex. And it's a simple device that utilizes the resistance stretching principles that I'm going to share with you to mobilize the foot and ankle. And uh, I'm going to end the, the session today by torturing Bruno for a little bit and letting you guys see. Uh, I heard... I heard there was a video that was supposed to play yesterday. Maybe it didn't play. This is, this is recompense for that. <laughs> so, um, At any rate, uh, the agenda, very simply, I'm going to share my story and how I came about creating DCT. Then we're going to define flexibility, and that's going to allow us to understand stretching, what the different kinds are, how they work, why they work. So <clears throat> I was a... a Gymnast my whole life and ended up becoming a springboard diver in high school. And I got a scholarship to UC Berkeley for diving. Um, and in 2001, at UC Berkeley, I was, uh, I was sidelined by what the doctors were telling me was a career-ending injury. I had uh, chondromalacia patella, so bone-on-bone -bone contact in my left knee. Um, and I was 19 years old at the time. So, um, as the slide says, I sat down, had very candid conversations with my doctors, and they said, look, you know, if you can't deal with the pain, pick a different sport. And um, at 19, that wasn't really resonating with me, so I decided I would look around. And um, I know you guys have heard similar stories like this, but it really is uh, the pain and, and the frustration is the, the primary driver uh, for discovery, for innovation. You know, need and necessity is the mother of invention. So I ended up trying everything, acupuncture, Pilates, rolfing, traditional stretching, uh, yoga. This is corrective exercise down here on the, on the bottom uh, left. Um, and I really got little to no results, you know, and I was, I was passionate about it. I was dedicated. Um, and it wasn't until the summer uh, of 2001, going into my junior year, that I met a guy who was doing a form of resistance stretching, an active form of stretching. And within two months of doing this technique of resisting while stretching a muscle, we were able to completely realign my knee. I mean, no pain whatsoever. So I met this guy. His name was Bob Cooley. And this is my original mentor. And you'll see that we did this technique where I was resisting with my leg, and he would pull it up to get a stretch, an active stretch on the muscle. And it looks terrible, but it was actually not very uncomfortable. And it led to these radical, radical changes in my flexibility and my performance. And that's me telling him how I feel the stretch in the leg. 
But the problem was that after we got, we fixed my knee, I went back to my sport, everything was great, but I had all these questions, like why did it work? How did, how did resistance stretching fix my knee? You know, what is tension? What is flexibility? And none of my trainers, none of my therapists could give me an answer. I'd ask them simple questions and it was like, oh, well, it works, so we do it, right? <laughs> but the truth is, is that I had critical questions I wanted to know. The first was, why was my knee injured in the first place? How come, why was I 19 years old and I already had a, a worn cartilage in the knee so bad that the doctors were saying my only recourse is 25 years from now you'll get a knee replacement, right? How does that happen? What is the mechanics of that? The second one is, what is muscle tension exactly, right? I would ask all my therapists, I'd say, what is, what is a knot? And they'd say, oh, well, a knot is muscle tension. And I'd say, all right, great, what's well, muscle tension? And they'd say, oh, well, it's knots and muscles. <laughs> and it was like absurd to me. I'm like, you're my therapist. We're working with tension to remove it, but you can't tell me what it is. Like, what is it, right? And then the last one is, how does resistance stretching, now DCT, work to actually remove tension from the body, right? What is the mechanism of stretching? And the foundation of DCT, the dynamic contraction technique, everything I do today is based on the answers to these simple questions. So we're going to start the process by answering the questions. So the first one is, how does tension cause injury? If you had seen my posture 14 years ago, I was the kid where uh, my left foot turned all the way out to the side, but my knees pointed forward. It was totally duck-footed, especially on the left, right? So the best way to understand tension is with a simple analogy. I like to call it the t-shirt analogy. If you guys, and I'm not going to do it very hard because I don't want to ruin my shirt, but if you start slowly twisting your t-shirt, everything starts getting pulled in towards the focal point where it's being twisted together, right? So if you imagine a muscle as attaching two bones, and in this case we're going to look at the hamstrings here, so imagine the hamstrings are a rope attaching from the hips to the knees here, right? Now, if you imagine tension or not, or the t-shirt being twisted in the hamstring, you're going to see that as the hamstring starts to get tight, it's going to start to pull the pelvis down and under, pulling the hips towards the knees and creating a hunchback posture in the chest, all based on shortening hamstrings and shortening glutes. Right? So with me, my left knee, if we look at the lateral hamstring, it comes down and attaches at the edge of the, the outside of the knee, the head of the fibula. So you imagine that rope pulling tight and it just starts torquing the knee out to the side. My knee didn't have any choice. So then as a springboard diver, when you load the board and you jump to the end, my left leg's my power leg. So it was just grinding for years and years and years, right? Since I was a little kid. So. Tension, as it forms, pulls bones out of alignment and increases pressure in the joints, leading cause of arthritis, aside from inflammation, but we'll get to that later. So in order to understand what a knot is, right? So that previous slide shows you how tension can injure you. Well, in order to understand what a knot is, you need to just a basic muscle physiology. You guys have all seen, this is a muscle uh, itself, a bundle of fibers and individual fibers. The important thing about a muscle fiber is that it's not this magic process where you decide to contract the muscle and everything just happens. Each fiber is made up of little chain links. They're called sarcomeres. So you might have 50,000 of these chain links in a line, and when you decide to do strength training, 50,000 little links have to slide together in order for your muscle to move. Now that's all fine and good, except for when a knot will form. So we're actually going to take a look at a macro view of tension. Here are the sliding sarcomeres. Right? You do a concentric contraction. One series of sarcomeres binds. No big deal. But you do it again, and then another series of sarcomeres fuse together. And again, and it keeps getting tighter and tighter. And it's that t-shirt being twisted, pulling everything in towards the center. This is what the formation of a knot looks like inside the muscle fibers. So how is it actually formed? 
right? I've still been really general about it. But you guys work with concentric and eccentric contractions all the time. So here's some of the physiology behind what those contractions are actually doing. This is a little bit closer in, zoomed in on a concentric contraction. And these are the myosin and actin proteins inside the sarcomeres, reaching and pulling. It's called cross-bridging. And again, you'll see, as you do strength training, some of them stick together, and then the ones next to them begin to stick together. What's important, what you guys need to understand for what I'm about to show you, is that the tissue that's stuck together is fused, but the tissue that's on either side is still able to work. So just because I have tight muscles doesn't mean I can't use my body. Right? That's why muscle tension is so insidious. You can have tight muscles for years, and it takes years and years and years to develop muscle tension, and you won't really notice until someone you go to a masseuse and they start pushing on your muscles, and you're like, oh my god, it's like a rock in there. Right? But this principle of sarcomeres that are adjacent to the tension being available to work is what actually allows us to remove muscle tension. So here what we're going to see is we have a muscle with a knot. The sarcomeres are all stuck together, fused. And we're going to do an eccentric load. So you guys know, when you load a muscle, you're resisting, and you keep resisting and start pulling that muscle apart. That's eccentric contraction, contraction during lengthening. right? So I want you to watch this view here. These sarcomeres are still able to operate, and they're going to begin pulling the tension out of the center of that knot starting at the edge. So the arrows show eccentric load, and watch as the sarcomeres begin to rip. So now these are functional, and they're going to pull and rip the knot free from the outside in. Each consecutive eccentric load is actually freeing tissue, making the muscle stronger with every rep. That's why in exercise science, you'll see studies where they say, OK, when we do negative training with our athletes, we do a couple series of negatives, heavy load on the eccentric, and all of a sudden we test them and they're 30% stronger concentrically. Why is that? They never ask why. They just know that it works. Arnold Schwarzenegger used to do it all the time when he was trying to compete against Casey Viator, these big bodybuilder guys. They'd load the bar up because they knew it made them stronger. Well, the reason why is because if your sarcomeres, your chain links, if it is just a chain link, right, to simplify, if you had 100 chain links and 50 of them are stuck, you're 50% weaker. Right? Eccentric load has the potential to free stuck tissue and immediately give you strength. Right? It's an amazing, amazing discovery. So how, <clears throat> to tie back into flexibility, how does this help us to come to a better understanding of flexibility? Right? And for me, at the beginning of my process and starting to create my own philosophy around body work and training and therapy, it was important that I had a foundation so that I could understand the results I was getting with people. Because half the people I worked with got great results, and half the people, you know, it was humdrum whether or not they got any results at all. And that wasn't, wasn't good enough for me. So, we're at the point now where we can actually start to define flexibility and come back to that initial, initial question of why it's called flexibility in the first place. So the reason why it's called flexibility is because when scientists were studying muscles, they found that if a muscle could shorten, then it could also lengthen. So the flexibility of a muscle, the ability of a muscle to get small, was directly proportional on its ability to lengthen. The reason why we think of it always in terms of lengthening is because that's what's spectacular. That's what's really interesting is somebody doing the splits. But the truth is, mechanically, structurally, it's much more important that your joints and your muscles can actually get small. And the way you can understand this is with the door hinge analogy. If I take a hammer here and wedge it in the crook of the door, right at the hinge, and then we start closing that hinge around the hammer, what's going to happen is it's going to rip the hinge apart. So look at this with your bodies. If I take my elbow here and I wedge my fist in the front of my elbow, and my biceps is unflexible, meaning it won't get short, but I force it to bend around my fist, what's going to happen to the elbow? It's going to blow it out, just like the door hinge. 
right? Now let's look at this a little bit more functionally. So who has the hammer wedged in the front of their hips? The left, right? So on the right, I have flexible, flexable hip flexors and quads, rectus fem. On the left here, notice how I have to substitute with all my back in order to wrap around the hammer. Now, if I forced it, which joints are going to explode? My low back. How do all your friends blow out their back? What were they doing? They were bending down to pick up a Kleenex or pick up their, 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 their the soap they dropped in the, the shower and all of a sudden, boom, herniated disc. Why? Because they lacked flexibility in the anterior hip muscles and quads. It's literally that simple. And I do this as a parlor trick all the time. We'll find, somebody, we'll find somebody who can't touch their toes. They're literally this person, who used, who used to be me. And in five minutes of eccentrically loading the hip flexors and the quads, never even touching the hamstrings, they can touch their toes. And you watch the posture go from deviation or substitution to true joint function. And it's miraculous. It's, it's an amazing thing. So the problem is, how, how come everybody's had it wrong for so long? You know, what, why, how is it possible? When I was in PT school, if we looked at the same picture of me substituting, uh, I was taught, okay, you can't touch your toes because the glutes and the hamstrings are too tight, right? You gotta stretch your glutes, you gotta stretch the hamstrings, they'll let the hips go and then you can touch the floor. But you can do that till you're blue in the face and you just have a lot of pain and very minimal, minimal results or you blow your back out. But the reason why there's been confusion is because people don't really understand stretching. There's actually two different systems of tension working in the body. One system of tension is what we just talked about. What I showed you is the muscle tension deep inside the fibers. Muscle tension leads to inflexibility or poor joint function, right? In order to understand the second half of it, I have to introduce fascia or fascial tension. And now fascia is a real big buzzword nowadays. You hear it all the time. But what is fascia? Okay? Fascia is a web. It's a three-dimensional web. It's pervasive in your body. It wraps in and around everything. Literally, it wraps around the muscle, the fibers, all the way down to the level of the sarcomeres. It's your tissue, it's the filler. If you didn't have any of it in your body, your organs, you'd just slosh around inside a bag of skin. It'd be, it'd be gross. Um, so we want, we want this stuff, right? This is, this, is the, this is the magic stuff. This is when, when you cut your skin and, and you have a cut, right? The reason why you can hold the two sides of the cut together and then let it heal is because scar tissue is always trying to heal your body. Now the problem with that is that, again, I like using the elbow. If I bend my elbow like this and I leave it bent for three months, my body's going to try and heal it into this position, right? And I'm going to get massive amounts of scar tissue in the joint, so much so that most likely I'm going to have to have it surgically cut, right? It's, it's, it's not a good thing. So even while you guys are sitting there, your bodies are trying to heal you into a sitting position, <laughs> literally. And it's the first thing, cats aren't stupid, the first thing they do when they stand up is they stretch out their fascia. So I like to use the wetsuit analogy. This is very helpful. If you put on a, wet si a wetsuit that was 10 sizes too small, right? <laughs> and then you try to move around, you can imagine the fascia and how it restricts motion. Right? So what is yoga and, and posture-based stretching designed to do? Because we know it's different than resistance stretching. You guys have seen what resistance stretching does. It rips out bound sarcomeres. Right? It creates, resistance stretching creates joint function. So yoga, the easiest way to understand how yoga works is with a simple demonstration. And I'll come kind of here. Um, most of you guys in standing, if I had you grab your foot, you could pull your heel pretty close to your butt, right? 
I mean, pretty close, within an inch or two. So that means, anatom you know, biomechanically, if we look at the quadricep, then the quad is this long. There's no question. The quad can lengthen this far. Now, if I take that same person, well, can't move too fast. Or, but if I take that same person and I put them in a simple lunge position like this, and then ask them to bring their leg up, they start screaming bloody murder that their quad is ripping apart. But how does that make sense? If all you could see in standing is the right side of my body, left side's not there, there's absolutely no difference between this position and the position with my leg down and foot up on the right side of my body. Now think of it in terms of the wetsuit though. See how loose my wetsuit is in standing? No restriction to the fascia. But as soon as I get into that lunge, watch my wetsuit get pulled tight. The pants get pulled really firm. And I start bringing up my back foot, and I'm stretching the fascia. The quadricep is no longer what we need to stretch. It's the connective tissue. So yoga isn't bad for you. It's brilliant at stretching fascia. It just ignores muscle tension which is terrible because if you ignore muscle tension, you blow out joints. So you need an integrated understanding of what it is you're trying to stretch, right? What to stretch, fascia or muscle? How do you tell the difference? The answer is by integrating it through a system that's designed to let you tell when you need to stretch muscle and when you need to stretch fascia. And that's what DCT is. It gives us a very, very simple protocol to follow that'll allow you to work muscle tension out of the body and then look at the wetsuit, look at the fascial body, and appropriately remove tension from that system.